countable and uncountable sets. In the world of mathematics, we often have sets of objects. The number of elements in the set can either be countable or uncountable in the case of some infinite sets. So let's look at the cardinality of a set. If we have a set of n elements, then the cardinality of the set is n. See here we have a set A which has 5 elements. Therefore the cardinality of this set would be 5. A finite set is always countable, but an infinite set can either be countable or uncountable. For example, in the case of the set of natural numbers, there are infinite numbers. Then that means the cardinality of n would be infinite. However, just because it's infinite doesn't mean that it's not countable. A set is said to be countable if it has the same cardinality as a set of natural numbers, even though the cardinality of the set of natural numbers is infinite. For example, let us create a set of even natural numbers n dash, which are equal to 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. Now we can create a bijective mapping between n to n dash such that for uh, x and n, the corresponding output in n dash should be 2x. And therefore, this would cover every single element in n dash without leaving anything out. And therefore, the cardinality of n dash is equal to cardinality n. Basically, we have to show that the elements of the set can be put in so, such an order so that no element will either be repeated or no element will ever be missed out. Now, the set of natural numbers, the set of rational numbers, and the set of integers are all countable sets. Now, let, because we can create a bijective mapping from natural numbers n to q and n to z, we can say they're countable. I will show you now. See, n is from 1 to 2 to 3 and so on. And now the integers, 0, we can map it such that 1 is to 0, 2 is to 1, 3 is to minus 1, 4 is to 2, and 5 is to minus 2, and so on, such that for x and z, for x and z, the corresponding output would be 2x or 2x plus 1, it will be 2x if x is greater than 0 and 2x plus 1 if x, plus x less than 0. And similarly, let us do it for the rational numbers such that in Q, it would be 1 mapped to 0, 1 mapped to 1 by 1, 3 mapped to 1 minus 1 by 1, and now we have exhausted all the possible combinations of 1, we take combinations of 1 and 2. So 4 mapped to 2, come up 2 by 1, and 5 mapped by 1 by 2 and so on. Therefore, all the elements are covered and therefore uh, the cardinality of Q is equal to cardinality of N and similarly cardinality of Z is cardinality of N and then there we can say that the set of natural numbers, the set of integers and the set of rational numbers are all countable sets. However, the set of real numbers is an uncountable set. This is because uh, we cannot prove a bidirectional mapping between R and N. This can be shown by using Cantor's diagonal method. Let us take a complete list of real numbers mapped to the set of natural numbers written in decimal form between 0 and 1. Therefore, that is this is the 0, 1 subset of the real numbers. Now, by we take the diagonal elements of this infinite mapping, 3, 2, 9, 5, and so on, and we make a new number out of this. And with such that the, fir the first element of this will not be 3, the second element will not be 2, the second element will not be 9, and so on. And we can uh, we can realize we realize that we are creating a completely new number which does not exist in an infinite mapping, and therefore if we add this to the subset of R zero comma one, the cardinality of it would increase by one, and therefore the mod R is not equal to mod n, but mod R is greater than mod n, and therefore we cannot create a bijecting mapping, and therefore the set of real numbers from zero comma one is not. Uh, is not countable and therefore this can be extended to the entire set of real numbers. Let S be a set. We can say S is countable if there exists an injective function f from S to the set of natural numbers. Okay, and either S is empty or there exists a subjective function g from the set of natural numbers to S. And either S is finite or there exists a bijection h from the set of natural numbers to S. Now, let us take two sets, S and T. If the function f from S to T is injective, then T is countable and S is countable. And similarly, if the function g from S to T is surjective, then S is countable and T is countable. Simon Stevin, sometimes called Stevinus, 
was a Flemish mathematician, physicist, and military engineer. He was active in a great many areas of science and engineering, both theoretical and practical. He also translated various mathematical terms into Dutch, making it one of the few European languages in the world for mathematics, Vis Kande, Vis and Kande, that is, the knowledge of what is certain, was not a loanword from Greek, but a calque via Latin. Now we are going to discuss about some of his contributes to ma uh, contributions to mathematics. Simon Stevens' most radical mathematical invention was his elegant way of representing decimal fractions and using them to carry out elementary ca calculations. His essay on the subject contains a description of decimal fractions, their application addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and even briefly root extraction. Steven writes in the same spirit of the practical applications of decimal fractions for dividing money and measurements of length, area, and volume, etc. Now, for example, let us take the, uh, let us take one of his notations, that is the decimal notation, three one seven two five three and nine four. Okay, this means three primes, seven seconds, five thirds, and nine fourths, and this can be continued infinitely. It can be seen from the definition that numbers are 3 by 10, 7 by 100, 5 by 1000, and 9 by 10, 10 power 4. And that this number would be 3759 by 10,000. Likewise, 8, 0, 9, 1, 3, 2, and 7, 3 has a value 8, 9 by 10, 3 by 100, and 7 by 1000, making this number 8937 by 1000 and so on for other numbers. Also, you should realize that in these numbers, we use no fractions, and then the number under each sign except 0 never exceeds 9. That is, we cannot write 7, 1, and 12, 2. However, we would write it as 8, 1, 8, 1, and 2, 2. Now we're going to start with exponential notation. The exponential notation introduced by Bombelli in 1572 was taken over by Steven with slight modifications, dispensed with the necessity of knowing all these signs and names. A single example will make it clear how greatly symbolic algebra was being improved by the innovation. From today, we use this algebra such as 5x power 4 plus 3x cubed plus 7x square plus 2x plus 3. To, uh, for, uh, in this way, we represent a polynomial equation. However, it was written by Steven as 5, 4 plus 3, 3 plus 7, 2, plus 2, 1, plus 3. This improvement will be appreciated even better when we add that the cosic signs, how it was represented in cosic signs was 5, 3, we're using, using this equation reading from left to right, were pronounced respectively zensis descensis, cubus, zensis, and cosa, followed by such terms as sorcid solidus, sensi cubus, and be solidus solidus for the higher powers. This fatal influence which a traditional terminology and notation can exert may be realized more clearly when we consider that the mathematicians had tortured themselves for more than a century with the caustic names and sign before it occurred to anyone that one might equally well say first, second, and third quantity instead of these primus, secondus, and tertius. Now we discuss about interest, simple and compound, and profitable and unprofitable. Interest tables for the solution of problems of compound interest had been in use long before Steven's time. However, the owners of such tables considered them as secret tools of their trade and refused their publication. Steven was the first to do away with the secrecy altogether. He wrote an exhaustive textbook on the whole doctrine of interest and annexed to all the tables necessary for the solution of the problem proposed in it. This book contains a theory of simple as well as compound interest, both of which may be profitable or unprofitable. This means that in both cases, interest can be added to or subtracted from the principle. Now we discuss the roots of an equation contribution by Steven. Steven wrote his arithmetic in 1594. The work brought to the Western world for the first time a general solution of the quadratic equation, originally documented nearly a millennium previously by Brahmagutra in India. Steven proved the intermediate value theorem. Intermediate value theorem for polynomials. Steven uses a divide and conquer procedure subdividing the interval into 10 equal parts and uses this to prove this. 
In mathematical analysis, the intermediate value theorem states that if a continuous function from say a to b will interval a to b as do domain takes values f of a and f of b at the ends, then, at, then it also takes any value between f of a and f of b at some point within the interval. Now we discuss Steven's contribution in equilibrium forces in trigonometry. Steven was the first to show how to model regular and semi-regular polyhedra by delineating their frames in a plane. He also distinguished stable from unstable equilibria. He derived the condition for the balance of forces on inclined planes using a diagram with a red containing evenly spaced rounded masses rested on a plane of a triangular prism. He concluded that the weights required were proportional to the lengths of the sides on which they rested, assuming that the third side was horizontal and that the effect of the weight was reduced in a similar manner. It's implicit that the reduction factor is the height of the triangle divided by the side. The sign of the angle of the side with respect to the horizontal. Steven also made contribution to trigonometry. This, pr this proof where the red is placed on this triangle is known as the epitaph of Stevenus. Although Stevenus' uh, conclusion is correct, his proof had certain logical defects as pointed out by Dister and Hewes. With theory so groundbreaking and an attitude so bold, it's not a surprise that Steven was considered as a renowned scientific figure of his day. So now we, we are going to discuss central limit theorem. Central limit theorem as per uh, in, in mathematical terms, and I'm literally just reading off text right here, is a statistical theory that states that given a sufficiently large sample size from a population that has a finite level of variance, the mean of all the samples from the same population will be approximately equal to the mean of the population. Now, that, that was in very abstract terms, so I'm going to explain the same concept with the help of an example. So, for the example, let's take the heights of all the human beings on planet Earth. And let's map those heights based on uh, the number of people who have the same number of heights. For our convenience, let's say that humans can only be either 120 centimeters tall or 130 centimeters tall or 140 centimeters tall and so on till 160 centimeters tall. So if we say draw a graph based on how many people have uh, corresponding heights, say not a lot of people are 120 centimeter tall. A larger number of people are 130 centimeter tall. A lot of people are 140 centimeter tall. An even larger number are 150 centimeter tall. But a small number are 160 centimeter tall. So from this set of values or uh, uh, from this data that we have, let's make sample sizes of, uh, for now, small sizes. So we have a sample set, sorry of a small size, say four. <clears throat> say the sample set has 120 in it, it has 130, say another 130, and say maybe a 160. So if we take the sample set and we try to find the average of the values in the sample set, we'd see that um, this would be 250, 380, um, 480, and 540. 540 by 4, which would come to approximately 135. So 135 is the average of all the heights in the sample set. Now say we take a large number of such sample sets of similar size 4 and find the averages. Say the average could come out to 128.25, uh, another 135, etc. Now, if, say, we take this data of averages of heights and plot it on a graph, that is, plot the distribution of these heights on a graph, we start to notice a sort of a pattern. And that pattern would be that, um, say, I plot all the distributions and uh, I do that and I draw a mapping of it, I'd see that there'd be a slight rise or concentration towards a particular value or a particular range in the middle 
and this is this this concentration is what will later give us the average of the entire sample set and i'll show you how so say we take um a large a, a sample set of larger size of say 200 so now the sample set of size 200 and plot the same distribution of all the averages we find in it and we'd see that this graph this concentration just starts becoming more and more towards one single particular value so if we take uh, the averages of the averages of sample sets that have an infinite number of members in them yeah so an infinite number of heights now this need not always be infinite it could just be sufficiently large but for the sake of convenience we're going to take an infinite number and if you find the averages of all such sets we could see or we would be able to see that all of them would tend to one single value that is one single value all the averages would be the same and this value is indeed the average of all humanites on earth and that is the beauty of central limit theorem it states that even if you have if you have a sufficiently large sample size which we did we had a sample size of 7 billion people that was sufficiently large enough and allowed us to take sample sizes of very big sizes and they, it also had a finite level of variance and if we mapped all of these and we plotted the distribution we'd be able to reach a single answer a single average which would be the which would indeed be the average of the entire sample set and that is the central limit theorem now we'll start the application part of our project and for this we have chosen a very interesting topic which involves central limit theorem and how it affects the societal behavior of animals in specific bees in this case now as a recap to central limit theorem central limit theorem is a statistical principle that states that as the number of repeated samples from any population increases the variance among the means of the samples will decrease and means will become more normally distributed or we'll get closer to a normal value for uh, a normal value for average of all the data that we have been provided with now the research paper has been written by mark one stevens kartha hogendoon and michael p schwarz it states that it has been conjunctured that central limit theorem has a potential to provide benefits for group living in some animals via greater predictability in food acquisition if the number of foraging bouts increases with group size now in context of bees this states that as the number of foraging bouts foraging bouts increases now foraging bouts is just another way of saying the number of trips to collect food increases the variance of brood weight which is again uh, a very fancy way of saying amount of food collected per trip will decrease and this is in alignment with CLT which states that um, as a number of repeated samples in this case the foraging bouts increase the variance among the sample means in this case the variance uh, of uh, brood weight decreases now if I was to put this in a better context I could explain the same by uh, drawing a graph now keep in mind that this is not the graph that is provided in the research paper but instead a very generic graph associated with CLT which will help with better understanding and not make things too complicated so say I take sets of um, foraging bouts or of brood weights per foraging bouts so say I take uh, sets of four of amount of food collected per foraging bouts and I find the average now if I was to plot this data uh, distribution graph I would find that it would look something like this now as you can see a rise in this section this is a rise towards a normalized value that would if uh, ever obtained provide us the average of the entire sample set so let's increase the size of the sample set over here let's consider as we did when explaining CLT sets of very large size tending to infinity but not quite infinity very large size 
If we were to use such sets and a large number of such sets, we'd find that the average brood weight or the average amount of food collected per trip would reach would almost reach a normalized value. This normalized value is indeed the average or very close to the average of amount of food collected per trip. Now what's interesting and uh, what uh, has been noted by the three researchers is that as the population of the community, as the population of the bee community increases, this average, uh, this average value, this um, value in fact increases. So as the population increases, the number of foraging bouts increases and as well as that, the amount of food collected also increases. Now, why is this topic so interesting? This topic is especially interesting because it brings in light the direct correlation of societal behavior. So, uh, societal behavior of animals in general, not just bees, animals including us humans. Societal behavior that we've been following for millennia and a direct association of this with statistics. So the very concept that statistics can be used to predict societal behavior is something that seems to be of great interest, uh, especially to us. And that is why we have chosen this topic. That was a presentation for application. Uh, thank you.